What's up everyone, this is Darsh Klobacci, co-founder of MGPOL and JSPOL and AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the Angular Master Podcast. Today we've got a special guest from San Francisco, USA. Amazing, amazing developer, amazing from Angular team. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Thompson. Hello everyone. Hey, thank you for having me on. I am so happy to be here. Yes, yeah, great. And then thank you for the introduction. I feel so flattered. Thank you so much. So how is going? Everything's good. Uh, Angular, we're having the best time that we've had so far on the team. Uh, it's a bunch of people who work really well together and we're able to do some really great work. So right now it's just really fantastic. Amazing. So before we start talking about Angular, what is Angular? Mm -hmm. Good question. And a lot of people are interested in this right now because we've had yeah. the Angular Renaissance. Yeah. So people are just like, what is Angular? So here's how I like to describe Angular. I tell people that it is a framework that is designed for you to build scalable applications with confidence, right? We want you to ship with confidence. So if you've ever used a web framework, uh, this is, is a web framework. And we really try to do things like best practices built in and give you the tools you need to have a good experience. That sounds amazing. So the next question is, why does Angular team release a new version every six months? Okay, so this is a, that's a really interesting idea because a lot of teams don't release major versions, but we have a really interesting strategy that we follow. We tend to release features that are opt-in and so as a part of that cadence, you're, we're not releasing breaking changes, which is usually what a major version means that it could be a breaking change, but we actually don't do that quite often. We actually do opt in features. So for us, it's okay to continue to release major versions like twice a year, because then we're never really breaking our community. And we have ways for you to catch up with the latest version through our migration tools. And again, like I said, everything is opt in. So you have a really good opportunity to catch up when you're ready. Amazing. So what are the upcoming plans for the Angular v19 okay so here's a little disclaimer we usually don't say what we're going to release at a particular version because we will release things when they're ready but one i can say what we're working on and what will be improving right now we, we just announced in v18 experimental zoneless so you can expect some new updates for zoneless support expanded support for zoneless so right now it's, it's experimental and we're still working through a lot of the layers of how zone js is integrated in angular so we're going to be releasing more updates to that story we'll have some more material three updates because we just re announced material three support so we'll have more updates for that you'll see some more stability coming to the remaining signal APIs that are not stable yet. Two of them are stable. We're still working on the third one, which is effect. You'll see some more. So yeah, here's a, a last thing I'll say. You'll also see some updates around what we're doing with partial hydration. Okay, so let's go a little bit further. Sure. How about 2025? Oh, that is yet to be determined just because we have our high level projects where we're looking at things like signal based forms, again, partial hydration, et cetera. So for that pace, what we'll probably do most likely is we will listen to our community after we get done with version even 18.1, 18.2, we'll get feedback. Right. Uh, what about like, for example, the hybrid rendering story? So all these things are in process and we're thinking about those things. So. Uh, version 20, which will come in 2025, which is amazing to think about. Well, we're still planning that one, but right now we're really focused on what are we planning for version 19? Amazing. Next question is, what are the most significant changes uh, in the latest Angular release? Oh, sure. Fantastic question. I think zoneless is a huge change for us because zones has been the way that people... So when you use an Angular application, Zones is the way that we are able to detect changes in events that happen in the browser. And then we use that as a part of our change detection cycle, which then re-renders re the page, gives you those updates. So now with optional zones, that's a make, it's just a major step because now we're going toward signal components where signals drive our change detection. And we're able to do really fine grained change detection, which is hopefully going to improve performance. But to get there, we have to get zoneless. So I think in version 18, zoneless is probably one of the biggest stories that we have. So how do you think, how has Angular evolved um, over the past few years? Sure. So I think there are two levels. 
in which we evolve the most. I think one is how we interact with our community as we're planning on the framework. It's interesting that now we're able to work more closely with our GDE community, more closely with our extended Angular community with the RFC process. That's something we didn't do before. So I think that helped us to evolve the way that we make decisions. And then our API surface has undergone some really important changes with signal-based APIs for things like inputs, models, queries as signals, right? So that's something that's completely different. So we've taken a lot of time to grow as a team and to change the way that we approach developing Angular. Okay, which feature or update are you most excited about uh, in the latest version? So this one isn't exactly from version 18, but I will say the feature that I will talk to people at length about has to be the defer syntax. I think what we've done with deferable views, which allow you to, at the template level, lazy load uh, parts of your component and even go further with custom triggers to do that lazy loading, I feel like that is just forward thinking technology and that's really giving developers something that they haven't had before. So deferable views allow you to minify, not minify, but minimize their bundle size uh, quite a bit by not shipping that unnecessary code, right, to the browser. I mean, that's just, and the API is right there in the browser. There's no fancy configuration. Deferable views, number one feature for me as recently. Then I guess signals are kind of cool too, fine. Signals are good, but I like deferable views. Perfect. How does Angular uh, compare to other frameworks? So right now, the we're in a very fortunate place as developers. You could choose almost any framework off the shelf right now and build something great. You could choose Vue, you could choose React, you could choose Svelte. I mean, there's just so many great options. But what's really interesting about Angular is that we're solving problems in a different way. And we're really squarely focused on helping people build maintainable, scalable applications. And that's where, as you can tell by the way that we do our framework, that lends itself toward that use case really well. And we think it's a really strong story. If you look at how big, big applications like Google Cloud Platform use Angular, even the new Gemini user interface uses Angular, Messages, Firebase Console, I mean, scalable apps that have to be performant and have a really good uh, user experience have to come from good tools. And we we feel like that we've built something really special that can help developers do things like that. That sounds amazing. So what's about RxJS? Uh, RxJS. So for f our friends at home who may not have used it before, RxJS is a library that is really designed for handling streams of unpredictable asynchronous events. And so for Angular, early on, we saw that there are parts of the framework and parts of user journeys where you may have a stream of, when I say unpredictable, that doesn't mean unstable. It just means you don't know when or if it's going to happen. Like how many times will a user click a button? You don't know, yeah. right? How much data will come from this endpoint? Well, it may be one piece of data, but what if it's a stream of data? You don't know, it's unpredictable. So if it's an asynchronous event, RxJS is a good fit. And we feel like on the Angular team, the RxJS has a really nice place where those asynchronous events can be handled. So that's where it's been fitting into Angular and we think it has a future with Angular. We, we need state management in the future? Yes, but my thought about state management is that you should really, Grab state management once you meet that need, because we think that using something like a service plus signals is a great place to start. But as your application grows, then it may make sense to get a state management library. And we have some fantastic ones in the community. One of the things about Angular that I love is that the community builds all of these tools to help each other and to help grow the ecosystem. So we think that you could start with signals and a service, but as soon as that doesn't meet your needs, there are just a bunch of fantastic libraries for state management that you can use. Okay. As a developer, I'm really interested about the performance, about the best practices. So how does the latest version of Angular enhance performance or any other optimizations? Sure. Optimizations are really challenging for web developers in general. So we're yeah. trying to give tools that can help. Here's one way we do that. We now, with server-side rendering, we now have support for full hydration. And we've extended that support down to our material components and the CDK. So hydration, this idea that you can send your rendered a, a screen to the browser and then send the JavaScript bundles like after, right? Like that's the optimization that people can have. But then we also have things like the ng optimized image. That's another feature that uh, developers yeah. can take advantage of. The furball views. So with lazy loading, so we have a lot of things going on there. And then in the future, we believe that 
when we move towards signal components and signal-based change detection that will also help to boost the performance at runtime. So what steps have been taken to improve developer experience and the, in the new versions? Sure. So one thing that we've really tried to do is standardize APIs and create new APIs where it makes sense. So for example, we had our decorator-based input, and then we moved to a signal-based input, which goes along with our other signal primitives. And now you have the model for, for two-way binding of values, right? So we're redefining the APIs to make them more palatable for developers when they have a smoother developer experience. And, and we think that's really important. We're also doing things like the new control flow syntax, where we moved away from directives as your control flow to template-level syntax that is more human-readable and easier to re reason about. Definitely. So... How important is a backward capability uh, in Angular development strategy? Oh, this is a core tenet for us because we believe that if we release new features but leave our community behind, then nobody wins. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make even major things like adding signals or standalone components, how can we make those features to be opt-in so that way you can upgrade to the latest version of Angular and then migrate your application over time. But if we just do all break and changes, we're gonna leave a lot of our community behind and that's just not our intention. So because Angular change every six months, so what are some best practices for migrating an older version to a new, to the latest version. Sure. So that's feedback that we have heard recently that the is it can be challenging to keep up. So here's what we're doing to help. There's update.angular.dev, and you can go to that site. You can get instructions on how to update your site. But what what we recommend is go one version at a time. And then also leverage our migrations because a lot of times when we release changes, like when we did the control flow with at yeah. if at four, we also released migrations to help you upgrade your applications. And you could do it at one part or you can do your whole application, right? So we are trying to continue to do those things. So that's how we say to do it. Do one bit at a time, but also leverage the tooling that we give you to help with the migrations. Amazing. So how has the community feedback influence uh, the new features in Angular. Oh, this is something that I'm so proud of the work that we've done because now we spend a lot of time with what we call the RFC, the request for comments process. So even when we did Angular Signals, we had an RFC and we took all that feedback and we processed it and we thought through, okay, where is the community giving us better ideas? Because believe it or not, the first syntax for the new control flow, for example, yeah. we, had a, we had a different syntax in mind. And then when we put the RFC out, we got a lot of feedback that people didn't really like that. And they preferred the at syntax that we ended up going with. So that's an example right there of how community feedback has helped us to improve Angular. And we'll continue to do that using the RFC process, working with our GDE community and listening to our external Angular community as well. Well said. So how would you convince a new developer to start using Angular over other frameworks? Sure. So as I said before, everything is great. But what I'd ask you, if you're a new developer asking me, I would say, well, what needs do you have? Because then if we if we work on the needs that you have, maybe we can find out where Angular so serves those needs the best. Because it may be a, a different framework that just does better for you. And we think that's totally fine because everything is great. But if you're looking to do a scalable application where you can bring in developers who never worked at your organization, but could look at an Angular application and then have a lot of ideas about how it works and understand the architecture and structure, that's one area that we shine in, where you can look at an Angular application from one organization or the next, and as a developer, you have a pretty good idea about how things work and where to look for things. And that's something that is really great about Angular. So if you want that, if you want a really robust community that's building really fantastic features, check out Angular. We think that you have a good time. Definitely, I agree. The Angular community is just amazing. Um, what are some real-world examples of companies successfully using the latest Angular? I know Google. Mm -hmm. Sure. So internally, we and externally, we use lots of Angular. Uh, there are some companies like in the U.S. There's uh, Build.com. Uh, they use deferrable views, for example, and they were yeah. able to reduce their bundle size pretty significant, significantly. Uh, I think Virgin O2 Media, they were also able to use some of our latest features and have some really important uh, production changes and improvements in their performance. So there are lots of companies out there doing some really great work with Angular and having a really good time. 
What resources would you recommend to starting update uh, Angular latest features and best practices? Sure. We've done a lot of work on the new angular.dev website, which just became stable and our main home for Angular developers. So we have a brand new set of tutorials that we encourage developers to check out. But also, if I'm being honest, I would say look toward our GDE community and our Angular community because we have some expert trainers there with lots of resources and you will just learn so much. And then we have other folks like yourself who are conference organizers who built these amazing communities and have all these learning resources. So start with angular.dev, but definitely branch out to the Angular community because they just have done a lot of amazing work. My last technical question is about uh, Zone.js, mm -hmm. optional in Angular. Uh, what are the benefits? Sure. So the main benefit that we're seeing right now, so two main benefits that I can think of. One is having to understand how zones worked to uh, handle change detection was what we call a sharp edge in Angular, where developers had to know too much about the under the hood development. And sure, some experts like that, but as a regular developer, I really want the tools to get out of the way and enable me to do good work. So not having to have that knowledge as a developer when you're debugging is going to be a big benefit for the developer experience. But then if we look further into the future, we're thinking a lot about when we get to signal-based components where zones are not driving change detection, but signals are, then we get to do some really smart updating of the screens. And then your component tree, we can go directly to the part of the of the component tree as opposed to starting at the top and parsing all the way down. We get to do a lot of great things, but getting to zone lists or optional zones is the first major you know, uh, stepping stone to get there. So I know that you are an amazing developer. So, but I want... Uh, to learn more about you as a person. Sure. So the f my first question, non-technical question is, what kind of person is Mark? How do you see yourself? Mm. I try to spend my time as a helper. I like to be just known as, if someone asks, okay, do you know Mark? Oh yeah, the helpful guy. Like, that's really interesting to me. How can I serve other people? How can I like live a life that is filled with service and love to my fellow humans? And so that is like the, the biggest thing for me. And then I'm a big family man. Like I have a, a child and a, and, a, and a wife and I just, I care about them so much. And I just really want to be remembered by them as a present father and husband. Amazing. How do you approach learning new technologies or frameworks or whatever uh, in this evolving field of software development? This is a really hard one because it's so tempting to look at all the shiny stuff. But what I usually do is I look at the lasting thing. So when I look at, when something new comes out, I won't jump right on it. I'll wait a little bit. If it's still around in six months, I'll pay closer attention. If it's still around in a year and still being maintained or still being updated, then I'll really start to pay attention. Then when I want to learn something, I just try to jump in and try to build. If I can build with it, then that'll give me an understanding of how it's all working. Amazing. So what's your favorite way to unwind after a busy day of coding? Oh, I love to play guitar. That is my biggest wow. way of unwinding. I just grab my guitar, put on my headphones so I don't disturb my family. <laughs> and then <laughs> I just go ahead and start practicing and playing. That is a great way for me to unwind. That's amazing. I play the bass. So oh, wonderful. Maybe, maybe this year on NG Poland, we can play something together. On we had to make that happen. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing, amazing podcast with you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, for you all, uh, just smash the button to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you want and see you next time. <laughs>